Hi, welcome. My name's Steve Layson. I'm part of the ministry team here at Jeringong Anglican Church, and I'd like to welcome you to our online prayer book service today. Uh, today we're going to be continuing our series uh, in Mental Health May, focusing particularly on uh, what is it, how, to, um, how does our faith impact our, our attitude towards depression? So Christians and depression is our focus today. Um, so we're going to be singing together, we're going to be uh, praying, we're going to be hearing from God's word. Um, but if you could open up your prayer books, the service we'll be following is on page 45 uh, of, of the prayer books, the, the, prayer for Sunday, the service for Sunday morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Will you join with me in Psalm 95? O come, let us sing out to the Lord. Let us shout in triumph to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his face with thanksgiving and cry out to him joyfully in psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his and he made it. His hands moulded dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as Israel did in the wilderness. When your fathers tested me, put me to proof though they had seen my works, of whom I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Glory to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as in the beginning, so now and forever. Amen. That psalm speaks of the glory and the wonder of God, the power of God, uh, but also of the power of our hard hearts. We so easily turn away from God and go our own way. In response to that truth, will you join with me as we turn back a page to page 44 and we pray this confession together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in thought and word and deed and in what we have failed to do. Have mercy on us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you and live a new life to your glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In 1 John 2 we read, If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the perfect offering for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Will you join with me as we sing our first hymn, uh, a hymn of trust and reliance on God. God is our strength and refuge. And we'll go straight from there into our Bible readings.
morning, I'm reading from the New Old Testament from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 to 18. 1 Kings 19, 1 to 18. Elijah flees to Horeb. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a message to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersabah in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he travelled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mount of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophet to death with a sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king of over Aram, also known Jehu, son of Nimishi, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shepat, from Abel Mehola, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death anyone who escapes the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escapes the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bound to bow and whose mouth have not kissed him. This is the word of the Lord. Our Old Testament reading is from Psalm 88. It is a cry for help from God for someone who is in the depths of depression. Lord God, my Saviour, I cry out all day, and at night I come before you. Hear my prayer, listen to my cry for help. 
So many troubles have fallen on me, I'm close to death. I'm like all the others who are about to die, my strength's all gone. I'm abandoned among the dead. I'm like the slain lying in their graves, like those you've forgotten completely who are beyond your help. You've thrown me into the depths of the tomb, into the darkest and deepest pit. Your anger lies heavily upon me. I'm crushed beneath its waves. You've made my friends abandon me. You've made me repulsive to them. I'm closed in. I cannot escape. My eyes are weak from suffering. Lord, every day I call to you and lift my hands to you in prayer. Do you perform miracles for the dead? Do they rise up and praise you? Is your constant love spoken of in the grave or your faithfulness in the place of destruction? Are your miracles seen in that place of darkness or your goodness in the land of the forgotten? O oh Lord, I call to you for help. Every morning I pray to you, why do you reject me, Lord? Why do you turn away from me? Ever since I was young, I've suffered and been near death. I'm worn out from the burden of your punishments. Your furious anger crushes me. Your terrible attacks destroy me. All day long they surround me like a flood and close me in on every side. You've made even my closest friends abandon me and darkness is my only companion. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, before we uh, spend some time thinking about what impact the Christian faith can have on the whole area of depression, will you join with me as we say the Apostles' Creed together? You'll find it on page 47. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, before we think about what it means and how we should respond to the whole area of depression, uh, we're going to be watching a video, uh, an interview with a lady by the name of Claudia, who is a sufferer of depression, to give us a little bit of an inkling of what it might be like uh, for a Christian person to suffer in this way, after which we'll go straight into thinking about how we should respond. My name is Claudia and I am an executive assistant for a Christian organisation and I live with severe depression and anxiety. I guess the diagnosis for me is I find life really tiring. I find it really sad and I find I have a lot of sadness but I find a lot of joy too and I think I have a deep just overwhelming sadness in myself that I can't explain and that's where I get then depressed because I can't explain it and I feel guilty. There's this just burden over me and that's just exhausting and that just lives with me all the time and all we can explain is that it's chemical and it's the way God created me and some of us don't have the chemicals that yeah that we just don't create those chemicals and every time we up my meds it just the sadness lifts and so we've explained that that's just the way that I tick. I think one of the hardest things was hiding it from my family. Um, 
yeah, uh, living in shame of, um, uh, yeah, not being able to burden my family with it. I think especially my mum being so close to her and um, not wanting her to feel like it was her fault that something was wrong with me. If it was just depression, I felt like I had to get over it and I had to get better. But I knew that it wasn't just something that was going to go away. I knew it was something deep down different. It wasn't just circumstantial or um, something in my environment that was wrong. It was definitely something chemical that was wrong. My faith is everything. I honestly don't believe I'd be here without it. Um, it's it's the, what keeps me going. Um, so I hold on to verses. Uh, I know that he has begun a good work in me and he'll carry it on until uh, Christ Jesus returns. And so um, often there's lies in my head and I think depression and anxiety does that. And um, uh, I hold on to truths. And even when I'm in a down or um, I just can't make right of what's going on, I just repeat truths to me. I have them around my room and even at my desk at work. and I. Uh, I know that Jesus is the same yesterday, today and tomorrow uh, and forever. I just know that he, he loves me and he has purpose for me. I, I always have questioned what the purpose of life is and I still some days get really tired and I don't know how I'm going to keep going, but I know that he has plans to prosper me and to, to not harm me. I could not do it without, without my faith. Mm. Well, today we're going to be looking at the whole area of depression. But the question is, where do you start? Um, we could start by listing the huge number of celebrities like footballer Andrew Johns or Greg Inglis, like actors like Robin Williams, uh, who have suffered from it. Uh, we could start by looking at statistics, uh, like the fact that in any one year, uh, a million Australians suffer from depression, uh, or that almost half of us will experience some kind of mental illness in our lifetime. Uh, we could talk about the over 3,000 people who die uh, at their own hands in Australia each year, a fact that we've seen uh, all too clearly here in Gerringong and Kiama recently. We could start by trying to define it and talk about what are the different types of treatment, although you can find a lot of that information um, on our website uh, as you look at the, the things that has been produced uh, for, for you and some of the links that you'll find there. Clinical depression is often called the common cold of mental illness, not because it's, because it's insignificant like a common cold, but or that it could take you know just lie lie in bed for a week uh, and you'll get over it, uh, but really just because it's so common. Many people, including Christians, will will experience this, uh, or or at least be a close contact and support for someone who does. It's a very common illness, which is caused by chemical problems in the vein in the brain as well as uh, other external factors. It affects how we think and how we feel, as well as our ability to function normally. It's interesting that as you look through the Bible, uh, many of what we would call Bible heroes uh, experience the kinds of feel feelings that are a part of depression. So for instance, in Numbers 11, Moses says, I'm not able to bear all these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. If you treat me like this, please kill me here and now. In 1 Kings 19, Elijah feels pretty similar. He says, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. In 2 Corinthians 1, Paul seems to understand it as well. He says, we were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of our life. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. All these heroes and, and others have uh, experienced what it is to feel that kind of depression, that weight of sorrow or, or hardship or frustration or grief. Now, I don't want to suggest that they've had clinical depression. I mean, I don't actually want to spend too much time talking about clinical depression today because this is something that would be much better done by uh, medical professionals. But what I do want to do is think about how the Christian worldview, um, the life of faith in Jesus, brings to this whole area, uh, this whole area of depression. Although it's true that many of us will suffer some form of depression in our lifetime, many more of us will experience periods of low mood and sadness, 
uh, caused by things like grief and job loss and excessive stresses, which, although they're not clinical depression, can also have a powerful effect on us. And so how should Christians respond to depression? The following tools that I'm going to share with you um, have been demonstrated to have a powerful and long-lasting effect for both sufferers of clinical depression and for those who are suffering from temporary sadness or stress um, caused by those things. Uh, I want to stress that these things are not cures. They're not meant to be hammers that you can bang people over the head with and say, well, just get better, just do these things and you'll get better. In sharing them with you, I want to lay them before you as tools that have helped others and that could be assistance to you personally or as you try to support and encourage others. So there's five tools I want to bring before you. And the first one are what what I'm going to call non-biblical tools. I'm not talking about things that are contrary to what the Bible says, but rather things that just aren't mentioned specifically in the Bible. Uh, To help us understand this, I want to tell you a story. You've probably heard this story of a man who was uh, stuck in a flood. He was at his home and flood water started to rise. As he started to um, put sandbags around his doors, um, he thought to himself, I need to get out of this. And so he prayed to God, God, please rescue me from the floods. As he was preparing his home, a man drove, drove past in a ute, yelled out, wound down the window and yelled out, Mate, you've got to get out of here. I can give you a lift if you like um, before the floodwaters come. Man turned to him and said, No, mate, I'm all right. God's going to save me. A little bit later, as the floods start to rise, a man paddled by on his kayak. He had another, uh, he had another seat in his kayak and he said to him, Look, I can, I can help you if you like. Um, I've got a room in my kayak. Do you want to hop on board and I'll take you to safety? The man yelled out, no, I'm sorry, God will save me. Later on, as the waters rose, the man climbed up onto the roof of his house. As he sat there, a woman came past driving a boat. She said, I've been sent out to look for for people who are in in trouble. Um, There's room in my boat, jump on board and I'll take you to safety. You better get out of here, the floodwaters are still rising. But the man said, no, God is going to save me. Later on, as the, the... the, the waters rose. He had to climb up onto the top of his chimney. He was standing there uh, with the water lapping at his feet. Finally, a rescue helicopter came over the top of him and yelled down to him. They lowered a, a ladder and said, Climb on board. The, the floodwaters are still rising and you'll be swept away. The man said, No, I've prayed and God will save me. Of course, uh, it wasn't too long till the waters overwhelmed the man. He was swept off. Uh, and, and drowned. A little later, he's standing before God in heaven and he said to him, God, why, why did you let me die? I, I, I prayed to you and asked you to help me. Why didn't you rescue me? God turned to the man and he said, well, I sent a guy in a ute, um, I sent a, kayak, a guy in a kayak, and a, a, girl, a lady in a boat and a people in a helicopter and you wouldn't go. Sometimes I think Christians can look at these non-biblical tools and think, well, they're somehow sub-Christian, they're not important for us. But uh, the, following, the following two uh, aspects, I think, have been shown uh, by medical studies to have a, a really powerful effectiveness. Uh, and Christians should make the, the, the most of these things too. The first non-biblical tool I want to bring to, to encourage you to use are medical professionals. That's including people like your GP, who should be your first port of call. Um, Psychiatrists, who are the ones who will uh, prescribe medication. Um, Psychologists, who might uh, use something like um, cognitive behavioural therapy to help work on your thought patterns. Depression, in most cases, is treatable, and these doctors will bring you great benefits. It's interesting, in 1 Timothy 5, verse 23, Paul says to Timothy, um, "'Take a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses.'" Now, I don't think Paul is suggesting that wine is going to be the solution to all of our problems, quite the opposite. Uh, However, what he's sharing with Timothy is some of his first century medical advice. You've got a sore stomach, take some wine to settle it. Paul's not afraid to use the the medical advice of his day. And so so Christians today shouldn't be afraid of using them. it's important to realise that when you, if you do go to a doctor, um, go to a psychiatrist or psychologist, that, that, that even they will not be a quick fix to, to depression. Um, sometimes psychiatrists will need to try a number of different medications 
um, and different levels of medications uh, before they get the one that is right for you. It can take months. Sometimes when you go to a psychologist, you won't click with them right away or um, they won't, a particular psychologist, may not, the first one you see, may not be able to help you. So let me encourage you to, to persevere, to perhaps try a different psychologist if it's not working for you, to, keep, to persevere with the medications that are being prescribed to you. Because in those ways, God has given great wisdom to, to um, our medical professions. And it's really important for us as Christians to make the most of them. And for those of us who are caring for those with depression, one of the most helpful things we can do is to encourage people to see a doctor. If you see someone who's um, all, down all the time, who's suffering uh, in such a way that it's, it's making it hard for them to function normally, encourage them to go and see a doctor. Maybe offer to take them along. Um, to help them with their appointments, giving them a lift if that's what they need. The second non-biblical tool um, that, uh, again, medical research has confirmed has, has significant impact uh, are those uh, lifestyle changes, things like sleep, eating properly, getting exercise. Um, these things have been shown to, to have a great impact on um, depression and other mental illnesses. It's interesting in the passage we had read from 1 Kings 19, when Elijah was feeling so low, when Elijah was feeling down, what did God do? Well, he provided, the first thing he did was provide bread and, and water and time to rest. In the early church, one of the characteristics of the early church was that they cared for each other's physical needs uh, through the organisation and distribution of food. These practical physical things are not somehow less important than more spiritual things. Our souls, minds and bodies are inextricably in intertwined. And by caring for our own and for others' phys physical needs, it can really impact our psychology as well as our souls. And so if you're someone who's caring for a Christian brother or sister who is depressed, depressed one of the things you can do is to try and help them with these things. Um, offer to get some exercise with them. Maybe go for a walk uh, with them each, uh, once a day or, or once a week, depending on what they're able to, to manage. Uh, maybe bringing over a healthy meal um, on regular occasions. Or perhaps offering to mind the kids so they can get some good sleep. Just because these ideas aren't Christian ideas um, doesn't mean that they're of little use. Quite the opposite. All wisdom is God's wisdom, and we should make the most of the resources that God has put at our disposal. So these are the non-biblical tools, the tools that are, that are accessible to everybody, whether they're Christian or not. But what does the Christian faith bring us on top of these things? Well, I want to suggest four things um, that can be really helpful to us. Some of them were, were mentioned by Les last week. Firstly, and most significantly, is the gospel. You see, our culture is moving in a very dangerous direction. Our sense of self is said to come from our feelings about who we are. Particularly, this is used to describe uh, in the context of um, sexuality and gender. We are who we feel we are. The problem is, of course, that depression can make you feel um, like this picture. This, is, uh, this uh, picture is of a thing called the melancholy statue in Geneva in Switzerland. And many t sometimes people who are depressed can feel just like this. Um, depression can make you feel empty and worthless. And if our sense of self is based on how we feel, it's little wonder that those who feel depressed feel like there's no reason to go on. However, the beauty of the gospel is that even in our lowest point, uh, we, to, we can remember that we are more than our illness. Jesus died to rescue us from the brokenness of this world and to bring us into God's family. If we are in Christ, then our identity is secure in him. We're not defined by our depression or our anxiety, our bipolar or dementia or schizophrenia or whatever it might be. We are, at the core of our being, loved by God and a precious member of his family. Our feelings are not a good guide to who God is or his love for us. In the end, we know that we are lovable, that we are loved, because God has sent his son to show his love. In Romans 8, verse 5, verse 8, we read, God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you understand that? That while we were a sinner, while we were broken, that's when Christ died for us, when we were separated from him. 
And that's what Christ has done for you. His love is not dependent on how victorious you are or how positive you are feeling. Despite your brokenness, um, Christ has died for each one of us. Indeed, actually, our brokenness can actually help us to serve, to, to make us realise that we are in need of God. One of the, the difficulties in our culture, of course, is that people don't feel like they need God. They have all the things that they need. Uh, these kind of feelings that, 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 that come with depression can actually help us to realise that we can't do it on our own, that we actually do need God. We are broken. In fact, it was the, the broken ones who often came to Jesus. It was the uh, Roman centurion in Luke 7. It was the uh, paralysed man in Mark 2, the bleeding woman in, in Mark 5, and the criminal on the cross. Those who realised they had nowhere to go, they had no help, they had no hope, who came to Jesus. So hold on to the glorious truth of the gospel that you are objectively loved by God and precious to him. Which brings me to the second wonderful blessing that God gives, which talks about the gospel, and that is, of course, God's word. You see, as I mentioned, one of the problems with depression is that it changes the way we think and feel. Uh, it's common for people with depression to, feel, to have feelings of doubt and despair. Why is God doing this to me? Um, is it, is it because he doesn't love me? But Is it because I'm unlovable? Well, one of the terrible things that, that, about Satan is that he, he's, uh, he loves to deceive us. He's often described in the Bible as the deceiver. And he will use depression to attack us when we're weak. One of his favourite phrases is, did God really say? Right from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, did God really say? And so he can do the same thing to us. We can start to doubt. Does God love me? Did God really say that he, he'll be with us always? Did God really say that you are worthwhile? Well, when Jesus was, in, uh, was being tempted and tested by the devil in Mark chapter 4, um, how did he respond? He responded by, by, bring, by going back to the scriptures, by, by answering the devil and reminding himself of the promises in God's word. And so it is the Bible that is, that is one of our tools, the sword of the Spirit, as Paul describes it in Ephesians 6. And it's, really, it's wonderful for us to remember that though we may feel worthless and unlovable, our feelings don't alter, alter the truths about God, about how he feels about it. And it's in God's word that we can be reminded of those truths. So, for instance, consider this small sample. In Genesis 1, verse 27, we're, rem we're reminded that God created people in his own image. No matter how, feel, how you feel about yourself, you have value in God's eyes because you are made in God's image. You may feel like that image is broken or empty, but we're all broken and empty in one way, and yet our value to God is unchanged. In Psalm 103, verse 11, we're told, As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. We may feel like we're in the depths, but God's love is far higher than any hole that we can put out, dig ourselves into or we can fall into. In John 3.16, the most famous verse of all, uh, that we're told that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Christ has died. And if we put our trust in him, we will have eternal life. That's the promise, a stone-cold promise. It doesn't matter how we feel, no bad feelings can take that promise away. In Romans 8, verse 38 and 39, uh, Paul says, I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor the future, um, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It doesn't matter how far you go or how, how far away from God you feel. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. And finally, in Hebrews 13, verse 5, uh, we, we receive this promise. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Those who are depressed often feel alone and abandoned. But the truth is that God will never leave us. Even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even like, though we feel like death very Slightly warmed up, we're told in Psalm 23 that I will fear no evil, for you are with me. These Bible verses and many others like them can be a great strength for us in the times of difficulty. If we can read and inwardly digest these verses, particularly before we go through difficulties, they can be there as a support 
and encouragement in the hard times that will inevitably come. Reading, uh, reading the Bible, memorising verses, uh, and even listening to Christian, um, the, the scriptures sung in Christian music can be a great way of reminding ourselves of, our tr- of these truths and lifting us uh, in times of difficulty. The, uh, the third uh, biblical um, tool that God gives to us, of course, is that, imp- of, that of prayer. Last week, uh, Les mentioned uh, the fact that we have great resources at our disposal. And one of the great resources is the Holy Spirit, who, as we just heard, will never leave us or forsake us. He will always be in us. Which, of course, is because of this that we are able to come to him in prayer. Prayer is a vital response for the Christian in, in the face of depression. It's a way of acknowledging what we're going through so we can start to deal with it. It's a way of finding healing as God answers our prayers. And if you want to see worked example of the importance of prayer uh, and, and how to pray, you, can, you can't go too, too far wrong by going to the Psalms. The Psalms are full of people pouring their hearts out to God, sometimes in good, sometimes in bad situations. There are some Psalms, like the Psalm we had read from Psalm 88, where the Psalmist pours out their despair to God with no seeming resolution. There are some, like in Psalm 13, that end up coming back to a trust in God. There are others, like Psalm 42 and 43, which are like a discussion with, with yourself, kind of arguing about, yes, you, you feel this way, but you shouldn't feel this way, and why do I feel this way? Um, and there are others, like in Psalm 55, that end with a testimony of God's faithfulness and answer to prayers. But in each of the Psalms, you'll find people who are opening up their hearts to God, expressing the full range uh, of their emotions to him, which is one of the great powers of prayer, quite apart from the fact that God hears and answers our prayers. In the midst of depression, feeling free to express everything that we feel with God, we shouldn't feel like anything is uh, unworthy of our prayers. We should be able to express everything to God. He knows what we're thinking anyway. And so we should be able to express anything to him. Two last thoughts on prayer. One is that if you feel like you can't pray, and sometimes in depression uh, it can feel that way, that you won't uh, be able to even mouth the words to God or, or, or find any words to speak to God. In Romans 8.26 we're encouraged that when we don't know what to pray, pray, the Spirit intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. In other words, if all you can feel are that, is that groaning, that pain, that suffering, that sadness, that grief, that depression, then even if you can't come to God, the Holy Spirit in you intercedes for you on, on your behalf. What a great promise that is. But secondly, of course, prayer is one of the things, one of the best things we can do if we're caring for, uh, for someone. Praying with and praying for someone who's going for depression is one of the most practical things that you can do. Um, which, of course, brings me to the last tool um, in the Christian's toolbox, toolbox when facing depression, and that is each other. Again, Les mentioned last week the importance of God's people. I heard some interesting statistics the other day. Um, an overview of clinical studies um, on the impact of regular attendance at a religious service revealed that over two-thirds of those studies demonstrated an increase in overall well-being, in hope, in optimism, in purpose and meaning, in social support, and a decrease in rates of depression and suicide amongst those who who regularly attend a, a religious service. Indeed, the Harvard School of Public Health in 2016 found that it, that, uh, it offers a five-fold protection against suicide. suicide. Being part of God's family, being part of the church, has a powerful impact on our mental health. Which brings, which gives us two, has two important implications for us. The first one is for those who are suffering from depression. Remember that God's family can help you. You may there will be a temptation to run away and hide when you're feeling low, but in some ways that can be the very time that you need your church family. If you really can't face coming to church or going to a Bible study, that's okay. But, but do try to think of at least one or two trusted Christian friends. Reach out to your pastor, contact myself or, or John, who can, uh, who can be there for you and with you through it all. The body of Christ is not perfect by any means, and sometimes they will let you down. But the body of Christ is there for you. 
So make the most of it. Reach out to your Christian brothers and sisters for help and support. And the second implication are for those who are supporting a person going through depression. The New Testament is peppered with one another commands, over a hundred of them. They all talk about our responsibility towards each other, primarily teaching us how to love each other. There's so much more that can be said about this, and, and Les is going to revisit this in our last talk. But can I just say that one of the most important characteristics of the love, of this love, when it comes to depression, is, uh, is that that you find in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7, which says that love always perseveres. The road through depression is a long one. You'll have many ups and many downs along the way. If you're supporting someone who has depression, don't give up on them. Don't hurry them. Don't rush them. Don't try to heal them. Just keep helping them, bearing their burdens. It could be that God's plan for, for carrying them through their illness is you. And you need to stick with them as long as you possibly can. Stick with them and also make sure that you have someone to support you as you're trying to support them. There's so much more that could be said about depression. And I've only been able to really briefly touch on things that we've, uh, the, the ones that we've looked at, let alone others. But whether you're going through times of sadness and depression now, or you've been through it in the past, or, or perhaps you're aware of a loved one who's going through it, I hope these five things will, help, will equip you to face it uh, to come face to face with it and to deal with it, work your way through it. Take hold of these five things that we've talked about. The non-biblical resources, medical professions, professionals are vital. Lifestyle changes, diet, exercise, sleep uh, are going to help you. They're vital uh, for, for us to, take, to make the most of. But also take hold of the gospel identity that, that has been won for you. You are a child of God, deeply loved by him. Turn to God's word for your strength and comfort. Memorise it, read it, um, listen to it, um, have pe- listen to music that describes it uh, to remind you of God's goodness with you. And then come to God, pour out your heart to him in prayer. Hold nothing back from God. His shoulders are, st- are broad enough and his arms are strong enough to hold you uh, in the midst of, you- of your suffering. And finally, don't forget or neglect the blessing of God's, the community of God's people. We are saved to be a family so that we might care for one another. And that includes through the difficulties of depression. God doesn't promise to take away all our problems in life. He doesn't promise to heal us of our depression or of any ailment, in fact. Um, But he does promise to be with us through it. And he provides powerful resources to help us in our time of need. So how about I pray that God would help all of those who are suffering in this way. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we know that we live in a broken world. There are many of us who are watching this uh, service now who are going through depression or, or have loved ones who are going through it. Father, we ask that you might give them strength, give them comfort. May they know your presence with them. Father, we pray that you would encourage them through your word um, as they come to you in prayer and through your people, that they might be encouraged by their their identity in you through the gospel. Lord, also that we pray that you might lead them to um, medical professionals that can, uh, that can find appropriate levels of medication and or uh, counselling that, that can help them through. Father God, we pray that you would have mercy. We pray particularly for any of those who are watching this service um, who are considering taking their own life. Lord, please give them the courage, the strength to reach out. And Lord, that we pray that you might save them. Father, we thank you for the, gospel, the good news that we have hope in you. We look forward to the, day when, to the day when Christ will return and take us home and there will be no more mourning or crying or pain. Until that day, we pray that you would give us the strength to deal with this and, and other issues that come across our path. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God invites us to bring our prayers and our requests to him, no matter how we're feeling, whether we're feeling on top of the world or whether we feel the weight of depression upon us. So will you join with me as we, as we pray uh, by following a litany, which you'll find on page 98 of the, uh, the Green Prayer Books. So let us pray together. God the Father, creator of heaven and earth, 
have mercy on us. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. God the Holy Spirit, the Strengthener, have mercy on us. Holy, blessed and glorious Trinity, three persons and one God, have mercy on us. Lord, remember not our offences, nor the offences of our forefathers. Spare us, God, Lord, Lord, spare us, spare your people whom you have redeemed with your precious blood. Spare us, good Lord. From all evil and mischief, from sin, from the craft and assaults of the devil, from your wrath and from everlasting damnation, good Lord, deliver us. From all spiritual blindness, from pride and vainglory and hypocrisy, from envy, hatred and malice, and from all uncharitableness, good Lord, deliver us. From all deadly sin and from the deceits of the world, the flesh and the devil, good Lord, deliver us. From all false doctrine, heresy and schism, from hardness of heart and contempt of your word and commandment, good Lord, deliver us. From earthquake and tempest, from drought, fire and flood, from civil strife and violence, from war and murder, and from dying suddenly and unprepared, good Lord, deliver us. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy birth, by your circumcision and obedience to the law, by your baptism, fasting and temptation, good Lord, deliver us. By your agony and bitter grief, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Spirit, good Lord, deliver us. In our times of trouble, in our times of prosperity, in the hour of death and on the day of judgment, good Lord, deliver us. Receive now our prayers, Lord God. May it please you to rule and govern your holy church universal and lead it in the right way. Hear us, good Lord. Strengthen your servant, Elizabeth, our Queen, in true worship and holiness of life. Be her defender and keeper, that she may always seek your honour and glory. Hear us, good Lord. Bless and defend all who strive for our safety and protection, and shield them in all dangers and adversities. Hear us, good Lord. Grant wisdom and insight for those who govern us, and to judges and magistrates the grace to execute justice with mercy. Hear us, good Lord. Enlighten all bishops, priests and deacons with true knowledge and understanding of your word, that in their preaching and living they may declare it clearly and show its truth. Hear us, good Lord. Encourage and prosper your servants who spread the gospel in all the world and send out your labourers into the harvest. Hear us, good Lord. Bless and keep your people, that all may find and follow their true vocation and ministry. Hear us, good Lord. Give us a heart to love and reverence you, that we may diligently live according to your commandments. Hear us, good Lord. To all your people give growth in grace, to listen to your word, to receive it gladly, and to bring forth the fruit of the Spirit. Hear us, good Lord. Bring into the way of truth all who have erred and are deceived. Hear us, good Lord. Strengthen those who stand firm in the faith. Encourage the faint-hearted. Lift up the depressed. Raise up all those who fall. And finally, beat down Satan under our feet. Hear us, good Lord. To all nations, grant unity, peace and concord. And to everyone in your world, give dignity, food and shelter. Hear us, good Lord. Grant us abundant harvests, strength and skill to conserve the resources of the earth and wisdom to use them well. Hear us, good Lord. Enlighten us with your spirit, all, enlighten with your spirit all places of education and learning. Hear us, good Lord. Come to the help of all who are in danger, necessity and trouble. Protect all who travel by land, air and water, and show your pity on all prisoners and captives. Hear us, good Lord. 
strengthen and preserve all women who are in childbirth and all young children and comfort the aged and lonely. Hear us, good Lord. Defend and provide for the widow and the fatherless, the refugees and the homeless, and all who are desolate and oppressed. Hear us, good Lord. Heal those who are sick in body and mind. We pray particularly for the people of India at this point. And give skill and compassion to all who care for them. Hear us, good Lord. Forgive our enemies, persecutors and slanderers, and turn their hearts. Hear us, good Lord. Grant us true repentance. Forgive our sins, negligences and ignorances. And strengthen us by your Holy Spirit to amend our lives according to your holy word. Hear us, good Lord. Son of God, we ask you to hear us. Son of God, we ask you to hear us. Jesus, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace to bring before you with one accord our common supplications. And you promise that when two or three are gathered together in your name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, Lord, the desires and petitions of your servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. You join with me in the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, evermore. Amen. Well, we've come to the end of our service, uh, and let me encourage you, um, if today's topic has, has raised any issues with you, uh, not to sweep it under the carpet, but to deal with it, and to, to, to seek help. We encourage you to come and speak to any of us here uh, at, um, at church, uh, but also let me encourage you, uh, if you're really concerned, to go and uh, see a doctor if you, if you are able. Uh, we'll be continuing next week thinking about the issue of Christians and anxiety, and in particular what, uh, how we should respond uh, when we have great stresses in our lives. But to finish off our service, let us, let us sing together a great, um, a great hymn based on an amazing psalm, which has been a great comfort to people over the centuries as they've struggled with the difficulties in life. Our final song is from Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd. So let us sing together. Thanks for joining us.